Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, show number 192, Finance Friday Edition, where we interview Tiara and talk about selling off underperforming assets to pay off high interest debt and proper capital allocation so that she can live long and prosper. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mindy Jensen, and with me, as always, is my Spock-like co-host, Scott Trench. Ah, I see that you still cling on to these nerdy intros, Mindy. (laughs) Scott and I are here to make financial independence less scary, less just for somebody else, to introduce you to every money story, because we truly believe financial freedom is attainable for everyone, no matter when or where you're starting. That's right. Whether you want to retire early and travel the world, go on to make big time investments in assets like real estate, start your own business, or simply fund a gap year to have a couple of adventures, we'll help you reach your financial goals and get money out of the way so that you can launch yourself towards your dreams. Scott, I am so excited to have Tiara on the show today. She is facing what she feels is a uh, financial crisis where she doesn't really feel like she has enough money saved for retirement. She's also got some high interest credit card debt and some student loans. And she's wondering if I make so much money, how come I feel broke all the time? And I think that your advice to her today for reconsidering her capital allocation is really, really great. I think a lot of people kind of uh, just continue doing what they've always done. And you brought up the... uh, uh, well, well, yeah, no, well, I'll just chime in here. I, Tiara had two problems, I think, that were really fundamentally hurting her financial position. One is that she was not budgeting for large, irregular, th- several thousand dollar expenses. There's a healthcare procedure, there's new car, all that kind of stuff. That has to be something you include in your monthly budget, you know, and, and we'll talk about that. That's that's called budgeting for CapEx if you're a real estate investor. And it's the same concept applied to your personal life where you have every couple of years, you're gonna have a big, large one-time expense um, if you're living a normal human life in America. And so you need to be able to plan those things. And if you don't, you might it might look like in many months you're saving 500 or 1,000 bucks, but you're really saving much less than that because some of that has to go to these large one-time payments. And the second problem that she was having is what we call capital allocation problems, where she's got a number of debts, a number of retirement accounts, a a number of high interest debts like credit card debts and significant assets in retirement vehicles and those types of things and an underperforming rental property. And by selling some assets, stopping contributing in other places, paying off debts according to a a specific approach, she can achieve a lot more freedom right away and in an ongoing basis in the future. And so I think there's a lot of, lot of great lessons to be learned from Tiara's story today. And I think you're gonna learn a ton here. One quick caveat, one of Tiara's goals is to fund a gap year in a few years. And so our advice is tailored towards that goal. We are not necessarily saying that it's a good idea to save up a lot of money or sell off some assets and put that into a... um, into a fund for a gap year rather than investing for the long term or anything. But that was her goal. And that's what we're helping her achieve around that. Well, also, I think appropriately caveating that like, hey, it's also good to sustain a pattern of investing for the long run. So I hope you enjoy today's show. There's a lot to learn here. A lot of cool stuff going on that I think um, really is great examples of investment and wealth building principles that you can see applied in practice in her position and how Um, with some tweaks, she can achieve a lot more freedom relatively quickly. Today, we're talking to Tiara. Tiara is getting a slightly later start on her journey to financial independence and has some debt she needs to take care of. She's saving up for a gap year and is looking for tips for growing her investments. She has a rental property, but she isn't sure if it's a great investment. So we'll dive into those numbers and see what we think. Tiara, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. Howdy, how y'all doing today? Oh, I love a good howdy and a good y'all. This is going to be such a great episode. (laughs) So let's dive right in. First of all, what part of the world do you live in and what do you do for a living? I'm here in northern Dallas, Texas, and I'm a park ranger. A park ranger? Oh my God, that sounds like an awesome job. Is that an awesome job? It's amazing. I love it so much. Oh, I'm jealous. I want to do your job. Let's have a pod- let's have a job swap for the day. 
<laughs> okay, so Dallas, Texas, and a park ranger. Let's set up your balance sheet. Let's look at your income and where that money's going. Well, yeah. Let let, let, let sorry. Let's create that uh, that that income statement and say, hey, where's where's what what how what's your what like what how much do you bring in from your salary? And I think you mentioned you have a second job. Like, what, how much income are you bringing in on a monthly basis? Got you. So, um, for my primary job, I bring in forty seventy. For my secondary job, I brought in last year about another extra thousand, and I'm trying to back off that second job now that I got some debt squared away. So about uh, a little under five thousand a month. Okay, awesome. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about how far that goes? Um, how much are you able to save on a monthly basis, and where where do your expenses? What are kind of your big expenses? That my biggest expense is going to be rent. It's about eighteen hundred a month. Uh, that little under five grand a month goes pretty far. I save about a thousand, maybe twelve hundred dollars a month. Okay, awesome. And can, so, can can you walk us through kind of maybe like if you're if you're if you're you're say you're bringing in about five thousand, you said forty seventy plus a few hundred bucks a month in the second job, which may end. Where is where's the four three to four thousand dollars in total expense going? Got you. Okay, so um, rent for one about uh, thirteen hundred of the month. Groceries, I do another three hundred dollars a month. Transportation, gas for me is like forty bucks a month. Um, and then I have some insurance insurance for me is about a hundred and eight dollars a month. I have some debt I'm still paying off to the tune of about fifty dollars a month, and then I'm paying the minimums of my credit cards and then student loans have been deferred okay so i'm I'm hearing thirteen hundred per month and then about seven hundred dollars or eight hundred dollars in other major expenses. Which gets to two thousand, um, but you said you're spending about closer to three or four four thousand a I've, month. I've been definitely three thousand dollars a month. That's much I average. Okay. Okay, great. And and um, how long have you been tracking or keeping a budget? Ooh, uh, this will be my second year using YNAP. Second year using YNAP. Okay, so you feel like you're pretty consistent about all of those types of tracking. Do you feel like? Do you feel like there's like any like some room or some thing question marks in your budget that you want that you'd want help with today that we should kind of file away or do you feel like you're pretty pretty comfy about how much you're spending on a monthly basis and the command of your money i'm pretty comfy with it it's just a, a discipline issue right i got really into plants and next thing you know an albo monstera cost a grand so <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I've I've not heard of, I've not heard of a, a, a plant spending um, um, issue there. So I'm I'm there's a pun here that I'll that'll come to me in a few minutes. But oh well, um, unbelievable. Well, ah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> that was fantastic. Oh my God, are there two of you on this show today? Yeah. We'll, we'll identify a root cause here. All right. Oh um, no. So <laughs> uh, let, let's talk. Let's talk about your uh, your debts here. Can All you right. walk us through debts and assets? Most definitely. So um, I have a 457 loan that's active right now. That's about $157 a month. Um, I have another year and a half left to pay for it, and the balance is about 1800 left. Great. Okay. And then I have three student loans. Uh, the only one that's not currently uh, deferred is about $50 a month. The balance I have remaining there is $2,400, and the other two groups of loans total out to be about 35,000. Okay. So you have 35,000 in student loans, but a lot of those are in, in forbearance through uh, September. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other debts? Uh, my partner and I uh, share three credit cards and the total on those credit cards is about four, maybe 45 or four forty five hundred dollars Okay. And is that past due or is that kind of like just your monthly balance that you carry and you pay it off usually? Our monthly balance that we carry, but we don't pay it off. We just pay the minimums right now. Okay. All right. And do you have and any... Um, oh, hold ahead. on, Scott. What interest rates are we talking about on these credit cards? In the 20s. In the 20%? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, I can see my first order of recommendation. 
Well, well, let's let's um let's keep going here. What what other debts do we have? Uh, oh, uh, I have a mortgage uh, in a different city, and now that property is being rented out, and that mortgage has a hundred thousand dollars left on it. So, and that's at four and a quarter, I believe. Okay, great. So you've got a rental property, and let's go. Any any other debts? No, that's it. That's everything. All right, let's go. Let's go to assets. So we we know we have a rental property. Um, can you walk us through kind of any cash you have on hand, investments, real estate, those kinds of things? Most definitely. So that rental property in San Antonio rents were about uh, fourteen, fifteen, and cash flows after property management and expenses and stuff about a hundred dollars. And then from there, I have a retirement account that's kind of like a pension because I'm a park ranger. That's at about thirteen thousand. And then my deferred or 457 um, deferred compensation plan is at about 28000 And I have a couple of investment accounts. And that is at $3,000. The other one is at 2500 My basic savings account is 5000 And then I have a 401k and a Roth 401k with my second job. And that's about 4000 all right, you said you yeah. Uh, I was just slowing down here. So you got cash oh. at five thousand, and then the four hundred one k balance is what? The four hundred one k balance for my second job is four thousand. And what is All that right. second job? I work at a grocery store. Okay. Do they have any sort of uh, pension plan or any other like profit sharing or anything like that? It's okay. But the four hundred one k that's still really awesome that you have one. Well, great. This is a lot to lot to work with here. You've got uh, um, uh, a lot of a lot of things going on here. And, and my first question before we get into kind of some of the details around this is how uh, comfortable do you feel around the world of personal finance and all of that kind of stuff? Like, have you spent a lot of time thinking about this? Is a lot of the, are a lot of the concepts new? Do you have like a, a plan in mind or, or what's kind of your framework for approaching things? On a scale of one to 10, my comfort is about an eight. I feel like I understand the basics. It's just that willpower and discipline piece, right? Like I'm gonna mm -hmm. buy that Monstera and I'm not gonna feel bad about it, but it is a thousand dollars. I listen to podcasts like these daily. I look at my budget daily. I kind of, um, I save and plan for different expenses and I make sure to, you know, take into account what the numbers are before I go out and buy expensive plants. <laughs> on your application you said we make a great living why do i why do i feel so broke and i think that there are a lot of people who are listening right now who have that exact same thought in their mind why am i feeling so broke i make such a great salary what's the problem so i want to know if you track your spending actively or do you do it after the month's over? No, actively. So every day I'll go through um, before I go ahead and make a purchase. Cause like, you know, YNAB has your buckets you can spend out of. And so I'll look at that bucket and take the money out and then go ahead and swipe my card and pay for the purchase, right? And so I'll look at that every day. Uh, I record what I spend every day. It's just, um, I've been spending a lot of time saving. Like last year I saved $20,000 and I only made 52. I'm really proud of myself for that. and. Um, I'm kind of feeling a crunch in that and I'm feeling regretful because I I think my account balances for my retirement accounts are great. However, the liquid cash I have, that's not enough. And that feels really weird to me. So that's why I mean like when I feel broke, we make all this money and I'm doing a saving piece, but why isn't my savings account kind of matching up with how, you know, how much money I'm putting away? Yeah, I, I think um, for, for me, like in my, my sense, the situation is I think that there is some 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 nuance to your budget and to make, you know, if there's 20,000, I, I still don't fully understand what's going on if 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 uh, because what you what you told us earlier, it sounds like you're saving like a thousand a month, which is still good. But 20,000 is a lot of savings, I think. But I think that like a bigger issue here might be capital allocation where what you're investing in and how you're choosing to pay off or not pay off debts is creating a. A situation that's very stressful for you that could be probably cleaned up within a year, um, and I'll, and we well, I'll definitely want to touch in on that in a second here. But because um, you have assets, you're just clearly building wealth. But at the same time, you've got all of these 
ticky tack debts that are pinging against your 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 cash flow on a regular basis and accumulating unreasonable interest in some cases. So I got you. Yeah. Okay, well, let me back up a little bit there. I'm sorry. So last year, that 20 grand came through a combination of putting away uh, a grand a month in that 457, deferring some additional money in my HSA. It came from some contributions to a pension fund that I'm not in control of, about 7%. And it came from uh, like little ticky tack um, contributions to my Betterment account and my Ally account, like $35 a week, that kind of thing. And just grew over time. And then, you know, the market's been okay if you kept investing through March. And like, like little things like that. There are some investments I'm actively investing in, then other things are out of my control and all that comes together to build up that 20K. Okay, so so a lot of that's going into tax deferred plans like the like the retirement accounts and the 457. Yep. Okay, great. And, and that's, that almost sounds like a 60, 70, 80% of what you saved went into those areas. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, great. Um, and then l- another question here before we get into some of the other stuff. Where, what are your, what is your goal? <sighs> I thought really hard about this over the weekend. I can't pin down a long-term goal, but my midterm goal is definitely in 2023. I want to take a mini retirement. I want to take a couple years off from work, kind of get my head straight and take a break. I've been grinding since I was seven years old and I'm tired. <laughs> my short term. Seven. Yes, ma'am. When you get in school, get them grades. You got to get scholarships. Let's go and do this. A's, 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 A's. <laughs> Good for you. But yeah, I can I can totally understand the gap year. Um, what does your gap year look like and what does employment look like? Can you take time off and come back to your employment or would you be switching careers? Both those options are possible. So my gap year, well, it would in, ideally in my head from 2023 to 2025, I'd be able to take a break and travel I would explore some passions. I want to learn how to renovate a house with my own bare hands. I want to uh, write a book. I want to go travel. Like long term, I would like to to, um, retire overseas in Portugal, but it'd be a good idea to go over there first. (laughs) And so (laughs) that's the plan too. And then um, coming back off of that, I'm at a point in my career where I'm at mid-level management. And so uh, I can probably turn the skills I learned in that gap year into like a director's level position coming back, or I can get a chance to pivot completely and explore a career in a different field. I love libraries and I love the post office. So I might explore things in there. All right. I, I, I love it. And I think that that gives us something very clear to plan around here. Can, can I ask how, how old you are? I'm 34. 34. Okay. So... So let's let's start with capital allocation here. What, Actually, what you before just... you start with capital allocation, I'm going to jump in okay. here and say you're not getting a late start. 34 is only a late start compared to all these 20 year olds who are retired early because they were software I, oh, 100% developers. 100% agree. Yeah, 100% and agree. Made $150,000 yeah. a year while they lived in their mom's basement in Iowa. And if that's you, I'm not picking fun at you. I'm just saying that Tiara is not starting late. She is starting well within the normal American time frame and actually probably pretty early in the normal American time frame. Also, we ne- we glossed over the fact that you saved $20,000. Hooray. Good job. You did excellent. That is huge. $20,000 in one year. So, okay. Sorry, Scott. Now start with your capital allocation. Yeah, you, you're, you're doing great with all this stuff. Um, and it looks like I, I would estimate that you, you have a, a just positive net worth here with all that kind of stuff with a lot of good things going on and a huge savings rate as you outlined with that. We'll, I'll, I'll have to verify some of that. Um, but here, here's the problem is you have 35,000 in student loan debt. You've got $4,500 in various credit cards debts. You've got a, a loan against your 457 um, with that kind of stuff. And what this tells me, and you're saving a lot of money. So what that tells me is that all of this is going towards retirement accounts in these types of things. And you're not cash flowing your day to day life, which is going to, which is what's going to cause you a lot of stress and cause you have to borrow against the 457 plan and all that kind of stuff. So I think we have to make a fundamental. And by the way, that retirement account stuff is not going to help you with your major goal here of in three years, taking a, a sabbatical for a year. Right. So I would oh, go ahead. The 457. So um, I can use part of that to do it because uh, taking withdrawals, I don't pay a penalty, just regular taxes. If I'm not working for the year, then my tax could be up to zero. That's how fair enough. But 
Yeah, but I wouldn't I wouldn't think of the 457 as as an ideal investment vehicle to save for this about it. It could be it could be good, but like I just don't know if that's the 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 purpose I would place under it as much here. But but, but yeah, I think there could be nuance there. I, could, I think I could be wrong on that. Um but bottom line is I think you should start have you are you familiar with the concept of financial runway? It's something I like to describe with with mm-hmm. uh, from your kind of previous shows. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, the amount of time you can survive without a paycheck. Right now, you've got what looks like what to be one month of financial runway with the cash in the bank right there. And that's a function of both the amount of cash you have on hand and the spending you have, which is largely being pushed out by these these debts here. And remember, if we're backing into a three-year time picture, the payments on that 35000 in student loan debt is going to be an offset to this that we have to think ahead to, right? Um. So what, what does this all mean? I think what this means is, is that we need to start, I, I, I wonder, and I'll just put this out as a hypothesis, if we stop contributing uh, as much to the 401k and even, and sig- maybe even significantly reduce the 457 contributions and begin attacking these debts much more aggressively, starting with the credit card debt, um, to begin knocking those out. You say you're saving 20,000 a year. That's a lot of we tax deferred. Let's call it 15, 16,000 a year. If you're not doing it inside of your tax deferred accounts, that means you can knock out that credit card and the 457 loan in no time and then begin deciding whether you want to invest or if you want to figure out a way to cash flow, like build assets outside of your student loans. I'll just stop there as a very high level thesis. What's your reaction to that? I completely agree. I started that process this year because uh, when I wrote everything down and saw that 20 grand number, I was like, man, I could really use that as cash somewhere. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so I started with, uh, I think it took effect in February where I was taking that money I was putting to my 457, 450 a paycheck and uh, just dropping down to get just the match. And then now that's how I got that $5,000 in my savings account. And so a combination of uh, that together and then, you know, our sympathies and then uh, just kind of like just putting $10 a week in there, just little stuff. And so that's why that built up that way. And that feels really good. And now I'm afraid to spend it. Yeah. Well, well, I think, I think, um, how, how comfortable do you feel having 5,000 in the bank? How good does it feel? Oh, it feels amazing. <laughs> so, so let me, let me tell you something you're not going to like here. I, I, w- I would suggest you knock that down to 1000 and put all 4000 towards your credit card debt right and and and, and here's here's why I, I don't think i don't think you should be feeling comfortable right now i think i think you've got high interest credit card debt i think you got a 457 loan the student loan debt is going to be a different animal you're going to need a longer term repayment plan maybe that's when you bump it back up to 5000 after that and then you can begin paying those down but I, the, the point of having an emergency reserve is to protect against an emergency and credit card debt is an emergency in my, in my opinion, um, around that. And so that, that's where I, I think, you know, having zero is too little that that's going to be very stressful, but if, but having a thousand, I think if you go back to being uncomfortable for another couple of months, you can make a lot more progress against, against some of these things, uh, and be, and be sitting pretty at the end of the year, feeling really good about having a lot of these debts knocked out and, and a different investment approach with some of these things. Mindy, what do you think? I do not agree and would give a different suggestion. So right now you are contributing enough to get the match, which I think is fabulous. That is literally free money. That is what is that? A hundred percent return on your investment simply for putting it in there. So I love that you're doing that. Um, I would say you said that you're able to pay or save a thousand dollars a month outside of like, that's just the difference between how much you make and how much you spend. That right. that thousand is that what's going into the investment accounts or is that just extra stuff? That's what's going into my savings account. So that five thousand dollars, that's been that thousand dollars since uh, February, and also the Timothy. So, okay, so I would say a couple of things, and I have the benefit of having read your application, and people who are listening have not. Um, you had a second job, and you said that you cut down your hours after paying off a couple of credit cards. I would start maybe not, you know, doing, taking on more hours consistently, but letting everybody know, hey, if you need me to cover your shift, I can cover your shift and picking up 
time and throwing that at the debts. You've got a credit card with a $540 balance at 21%. Take every dollar you have and throw it at that, knock that card out, and then cut it up, unless it's your oldest card. Whatever is your credit card that you've had open the longest, keep that open, but don't use it anymore. Um, I don't like these 22, 23% interest rates. I, I want to yell at the banks for charging that. That's a lot. Mindy, I, I'm, I'm a little confused though. Where, where, where do you disagree with me? I'm not done yet, Scott. I disagree with oh. taking the 5,000 out of your savings account oh, and okay. throwing it okay. at the, I would rather have that in the bank because that's when you get those really crazy expenses that you have to cover and you're like, oh, where am I going to get this money from? Oh, a 22% interest rate credit card. Um, so we'll get, we'll knock that one out uh, in April or May. We will knock out the next one has about an $800 balance at 23%. So you have um, restaurant budgets. I want you to cut the entire restaurant budget and throw it at those cards and then Get those two with the sub $1,000 payments or balances, get those, knock those out, and then start attacking the one that has about a $2,700 balance. And again, attack that until it's all gone while keeping the $5,000 in the bank because we want to make sure that we do have a buffer. So with that part, I disagree with Scott, but the rest of it, I like. I, I want to continue to disagree here because okay. look, you just said, hey, if you have an emergency, you gotta get it you gotta then pay for it with a twenty one percent credit card. She's already paying twenty one percent in her credit card with the with, with 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 what's going on here. So that's a guarantee. Why why not take the guarantee and pay that off um with the with the five thousand she has in the bank and then now she's got a thousand, which is still a buffer between her and the world. And if she does need to finance something she's got clearly got the credit limit to be able to to put that back on the credit card if the the tires do go out and, and blow and those kinds of things but i, I think we're, we're arbitraging interest rate really inappropriate there zero percent for 21 percent with cash she has on hand and i'm not convinced tiara that you need to um overhaul i, I think i think you should still be kind of focused on like Hey, this is still heavy lift mode, but you're not, I don't think you're that far away from being out of heavy lift mode and moving into more of like a longer term sustainable approach with that. I, I wouldn't cut your hours quite yet, but you're probably only like two or three, four months away from, um, on the second job for, from being like in a place where all these debts are, are, are paid off there. So what's your I reaction to that, Mindy? I out there. So like I have been doing exactly what Mindy was talking about with that debt snowball and throwing things at those credit card debts. But my partner needs implants, dental implants, and it was about seven grand. So I had to pivot and like really take all that money I was paying toward those credit card debts because those credit cards were at three grand a piece before about oh. uh, this time last mm. year. And so I had to pivot all that money to kind of start saving for that dental surgery because he needs molars. Steak is delicious. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, that that's and that's a great use of that. That that, that makes perfect sense. That's that's I think a a, a, a great. Are, is that what? Have you already paid that, or is there? Are no, you a, I haven't paid that at all. I've taken all that money we were paying. We were paying a uh, hundred and fifty a week on each one of those cars until we got rid of them, and then this popped up that where he needed the surgery and a surgery surgery is about seven thousand dollars. And so once we get to that seven thousand dollars in that account that has a five grand then we're taking all that to pay for a surgery and i'll be back at zero so okay so that make that makes sense then that, that i think that that cha that that negates the entire argument mindy and i were having uh around that <laughs> but it's still uh, a good so, discussion to have scott yeah. <laughs> yeah. um okay so then have you checked with the dentist does he offer any sort of financing plans some dentists will offer like a zero percent financing just so you can get the the work done. Um, and if this dentist doesn't, then maybe another dentist does. I definitely will. Oh my goodness. I didn't even think to think about that. Yeah. And I mean, even if it's like a really, really low interest rate, maybe, you know, 5% down, or do they offer a discount for paying cash and see if there's um, anything you can do to, to tweak that at all? Because these, uh, I have found that dentists frequently have a financing program that they can offer. Um, let's see. Okay. So let's look at, you know what, Scott, I'd like to look at the, uh, rental property as well. 
Yeah, that 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 was where I was hoping to go next as well. Yeah, could you walk us through kind of debt, the equity, how you get to that estimation of a hundred dollars a month in cash flow, and what that property is looking like? Definitely. So, um, I pay two hundred dollars a month for property management. The rent is fourteen fifteen, and uh, the mortgage now, now that PMI has dropped, is one or ten ten, right? And uh, there's HOA fees of. 200 a year and the house is about 10 years old so everything's starting to kind of you know break great okay so we have 1415 in rent we've got 200 or we've got uh 10 percent in property management how much in property management 200 dollars. 200 a month in property management we've got a 10 10 mortgage which is 12 10 now in expenses and you got 200 and uh an hoa which is 14 10 in expenses right no, two hundred a year, so twenty bucks a month. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, that makes, okay. That's much more makes much much more sense. How much do you budget for maintenance and utilities and those kinds of things? Uh, zero. <laughs> so uh, anything that's left over after the mortgage mm -hmm. and after property management just kind of sits in its own account, and that just builds up. And then I pay out the HOA fees, and right now in that account is maybe four hundred and fifty dollars. This is my third year renting that house out. And if anything comes up, then it comes out of that account first. And then I'll look to uh, my savings and see what I have to cover it. How did you come to own this property? It's my first house. So I moved here from Georgia about 10 years ago. And I moved to Dallas for an opportunity to be out here in these woods. And uh, now I just have it. I didn't want to let it go because a part of my um, plan after that gap year is to come back to it. Awesome. How, how, what's the mortgage on this property? And how much do you estimate it's worth? The house might be worth about $220,000 if I do a couple updates, like flooring and painting and stuff. And uh, the mortgage I have left is $100,000. So you have $120,000 in equity sitting in this property, if these numbers are correct. What I am seeing right now in the real estate market is that there aren't enough houses for sale. So houses you listed at 220 and you get into a bidding war. And I'm not familiar with the, the specific market that it's in. So, you know, take this with a grain of salt. But I'm seeing this across a lot of places in America. Now is a really great time to be a seller and not a great time to be a buyer because there's just nothing on the market. Um, I'm wondering if it would be a better financial choice to sell it and take that $120,000 in equity pay off the credit cards, get the dental surgery, pay off the student loans, put anything else in after-tax investment funds, and just cut ties and be done. If your plans are to travel, you don't need a house. And you would be renting it out, which is great, but if you could it's it's not cash flowing. Like if you were making $700 a month on this property, I would be having different advice. But you're not you're not making very much of anything. It's 10 years old at the 10 year mark. Little things start to break and then bigger things start to break. And then all of a sudden it's a big pile of deferred maintenance and nobody wants to buy it from you at any price. Um, you said this is your third year renting it. Does that mean that you lived in it up until three years ago? Yes. OK, so we are hitting upon the Section 20, 121 timeline. So you can sell it and hopefully you have been uh, taking depreciation as a rental. And so because when you sell it, you are the government's going to assume you did and will make you pay depreciation recapture when you sell it. Uh, but you lived in it for two of the last five years, which means that it was your primary residence. You can sell it and pay no capital gains taxes. So this is something that you're going to want to talk to an agent about and see if you can list it. Uh, when does your current lease end? December of this year. December. Oh, my lease, that, or the place I'm renting now, or the tenant's lease? The tenant's lease. December of this year. Okay, so you can sell an occupied property if you have like history documentation for, you know, when they pay rent and they're a great tenant and here's all the things and here's their lease and blah, blah, blah. It's a lot easier to sell a, a tenanted property with a good tenant as opposed to somebody who isn't paying rent and causing you a lot of headaches. And you're like, I just want to get out of here and don't want to deal with this anymore. So I would start the documentation process of how great of a tenant you have. If you have a great tenant, I would talk to a real estate agent about what is it worth 
How long do they think it will take to sell, et cetera? And I would talk to your tax preparer or a CPA and ask them about the depreciation recapture. Can they double check that you've been doing all the things properly so that you can make the most amount of money and, and uh, take the most advantage of the Section 121 exclusion for primary residence capital gains taxes? Scott, I saw you yeah. tried to say a bunch I, I of just, things. I just want to chime in and say I absolutely agree with everything Mindy said. I think that's brilliant to think through that whole thing, Mindy, about, hey, there's you if you've lived there for two of the past, so the difference between what she's saying, if it's a rental property and you sell it for two twenty, you're probably gonna pay taxes on like I don't know, fifty grand of gains at least, right? I don't know. I don't remember. It depends on what you bought it for. But if it's your primary residence because you apply, you apply for this law because you you for the tax exemption here, then that's a hundred thousand in cold hard cash that will come flowing into your bank account the moment you sell this property. I also want to emphasize this is not a cash flowing property. You you, you are you're bringing in fourteen fifteen a month in rent. You are spending ten ten in your mortgage, so that leaves us with three hundred. I'm sorry, four hundred and five dollars left between that you have two hundred dollars in property management which gives you two hundred and five dollars then you're you're going to experience vacancy five percent vacancy on an average basis so that that's going to be um uh 70 bucks now you're down to 130 you're going to have repairs every once in a while i would budget 250 to 300 at least for those repairs those will those will come up a month and those will those will come in large infrequent chunks when you got to replace the roof or remodel the place and those and, and and those types of things so i think you're you're losing money on average on a monthly basis it's just that most months you don't have that big maintenance expense or vacancy expense and that's why it's masking it feels like a little bit of money is coming into your account every month but i think i think if you run the analysis with those numbers you'll see you're losing money here and you got you, this is this is the key to the kingdom, in my opinion, for a lot of this stuff. Matt, you take a hundred grand, you wipe out every single one of those debts, you flush your emergency reserve with six months of reserve, and you begin dumping the rest into a longer long term investment strategy or even another rental property that makes more sense as a rental. Um, I think I think that completely solves tons of your problems there, and then you can get back to okay, what's my sustainable average monthly approach right there. I mean, that's that's your year off uh, right there in, inside of that stuff. If, if you wanted to take that tomorrow, um, you can be completely debt free and have 60, 70 grand in the bank, it seems like with that, um, rather than losing money on average every month with this. I, I just want to completely emphasize everything Mindy said with how much I agree. Thank you, Scott. Um, and you can, you have student loans that are deferred right now. You could even do a little bit of playing around, you pay off everything that isn't deferred, and then just hold on to that for a minute, make sure that all of the things are going through and you don't have any big expenses. And then when they come out of forbearance, you knock them out. But yeah, I love that idea. Definitely something to think about. Talk to your partner, you know, run the numbers, talk to an agent who's more familiar with the market and just see what sort of, you know, maybe you think it's worth 220, but it's actually worth 240 or 180. But either way, you've still got a lot of money sitting in that property that could be put to better use. And again, if it was cash flowing much more, I would have a different suggestion. But not every property makes sense as a rental. I just sold my former uh, primary residence as well because it didn't make any sense as a rental and it had appreciated a lot. Yeah, it, either that or you need to rethink through how you make these numbers look better. For example, um, can you refinance? Can you find a different property manager that's cheaper? Can you raise the rents? Those types of things. I mean, there's a there, it could be that there's a way to make this into a better cash flowing property. But as it stands now, if those numbers are, if you believe those numbers are are pretty reasonable, um, this is a loser as a rental property. But it's a huge winner for your overall financial position um, if you can if you can pull off directionally what we kind of just just articulated there what do you think uh first thing that comes to my mind is like ah, and that's just a scarcity mindset that i have i think if i sell that house i won't be able to get another one ever in my life i don't know why i think that but that's just the truth right everything in san antonio has been like skyrocketing in price and so yeah i'd sell it and i knock out you know these short-term goals but like what what do i do 10 years from now i don't know 
Well, well, that's where I think you need a philosophy or a system for investing in general, right? So let's pretend this property didn't exist. The philosophy for me would be, hey, every every month you're saving thousand to fifteen hundred bucks. You're dumping that towards the highest, best, next investment, which right now is your credit card, right? Because that's a twenty one percent, twenty three percent guaranteed interest rate return, right? And once you've knocked out all those debts, then it goes to what's my long term investing philosophy? For me, for Scott Trench, that's I invest regularly in index funds. I dump, you know, a few thousand dollars a month into index funds. It might be a few hundred or whatever it is, um, and then. I also set aside money to regularly buy real estate properties bit by bit, year after year, one by one over the course of a, a long period of time. So I think you need to have a philosophy about, hey, how do I want to build wealth and what's my why here? It sounds like your why is at the very beginning, just like, how do I get enough to take a no um, stress year sabbatical where I write my book and do some traveling and all that kind of stuff. But you probably also wouldn't mind being able to have plenty left over in your retirement accounts that those are compounding at the very least, even if you're not building other wealth through that year you're off, right? Um, or they're, they're just in the market um, having a chance to grow. And so I, you know, I think, I think that's the strategy is you need, you need an investment philosophy and uh, overall, and you're not in position to um, act on that investment philosophy because of the the ticky tack things I used that earlier inside of your financial position with your credit card and your four oh you know four fifty seven loan and the other kinds of stuff and so if you can clean that all up, get your six month emergency reserve really in place and feel good, which is which is you know you can also look look at that as your your sabbatical fund. What, what's the word you used? It was not sabbatical. A gap year. Gap year, yes. So yeah, it's, that's your gap year fund or you know twelve months. Um, uh, put, putting that in there. And then everything else on top of that for the next couple of years goes towards your investment philosophy. But I think that, that, that's got to, you know, that probably needs to happen simultaneously with the sale of the, of the rental property, or, or if you, if you like that suggestion for you to feel good about it, because right now you're like, Oh, I just have that property. It's, I bought it when it was so low. Look at how high it is now. There'll never be another property like that. But there's always more assets, whether they're rental properties, whether they're stocks, whether they're small businesses you create, whether it's a book you write that becomes an asset for you. There's always another asset that you can build or create um, with that. I just don't think right now this asset is helping move you towards your goals. I hear what you're saying. And deep down inside, I pretty much agree. But man, it's I'm like the first homeowner in my family. It means so much. Take a picture of the home and frame it on your wall. And then once you sell it, you can buy that Dilophysis, whatever plant that you want for $1,000. No more plants. How about this? No more plants until you sell the house. Oh, bro, who lists it today? All right. Yeah. <laughs> I, do not list it today. Do not list it today because you have some research to do before you do that. Sorry, this is not like a rush decision. I just want to be careful because like the CPA may have some stuff about like there may be a thirty thousand dollar tax question here, depending on whether you are or are not qualifying for that rule where you lived in it for two out of the last five years or whatever it is. So um that that's this is definitely one to to say like, okay, some of that five thousand dollars I'm gonna put towards hiring a CPA. Um, to, to advise me on this, um, that, that might be really good money well spent in the, in the context of this decision, even though it will be painful. It's a few hundred bucks, but yes. And we are recording this on April 12th. We've got tax day coming up. There isn't a CPA on the planet, unless it's your brother, that's going to answer your call in the next three days. So, uh, yeah, definitely. I thought they ex extended the deadline. They might've extended the deadline, but there's still CPAs that are cranking it out right now. So. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the deadline is. Actually, Carl's doing the taxes today, though. So maybe mm -hmm. something's going on. Are corporate taxes due on the same time? Or maybe that was corporate March? taxes are due when your shareholders want them. Um, now, <laughs> uh, you, 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 you asked about um, uh, you, you, you mentioned that this is like your first time, you know, first person to be a homeowner and all that kind of good stuff. So take a, as many said, take a picture of the house and then compare that to all the pictures you're going to take on your, your gap year trip and ask mm -hmm. yourself which one, which, which collection you want more and ask yourself like, Hey, do some mental math. Like, is that gap year really three years away after you do this? No, I no Look, look, if, if, from my seat, like I would be telling you, I, I would kind of be like, oh, financial freedom is a key goal and a gap year will not help towards that. 
but this is certainly an option for you that has a cleaner financial outcome than sorry if you if you could go with the sell the property option pay off all those debts and fund the emergency reserve you might be six months away from having the option to take the gap year and you could spend the next three years significantly padding your financial position or taking that gap year in six months to a year from now that really puts things in perspective and i have a cpa that i work with and um that call is coming up here, I think, because it was extended to like May the 15th, I think. And so our call is coming up as soon as I get my life together. And um, man, it, so it you saying that as I stutter over this kind of puts things into perspective because this was a, a pie in the sky years from now. I don't even know what reality will look like possibility, right? My gap year. But if the house is what's holding me back, Whew. Well, 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 what's holding you back is something's going on where you've got a 457 loan and credit cards and you've got this expense that you're not saving up for. So, so you are having an overall day to day, month to month capital allocation issue where you've, you're putting too much money, I think, in retirement accounts and you don't have a clean set of debts um, and making progress against those. And that's the root cause. So make sure you, we did, we talked about uh, plant jokes here earlier. So I, I, you really need to get kind of consistent, get your framework down there and say, if I'm going to bring in a thousand a month, then 800 of that is going to go to my emergency reserve until it's here. After that, it's going to go to investments. Some of that's going to be in retirement accounts. Some of it's not so that I have optionality and runway in my life, um, with that. And, you know, I, I first things first, I got to clean up those debts. The, 120,000 year rental property is just a huge Kickstarter or jump jump start on that journey because you can just clear out all those debts and fund your emergency reserve and begin investing big chunks of that um, into the market if there's le if it's left over and you, and you do and you're and you're smart with that. So I don't want to say that that's the that's the that's not the the whole thing in the in the financial position. The bigger issue is I think whatever you do on a month to month basis over the next five, 10, 20 years with your finances. But that that's pretty nice to have 120K there that could that could give you all of those options at once and just completely clear this out and you restart with a with a um a prototypical uh financial uh, uh balance sheet, I guess. I understand yeah. what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Well, and think back, how much are you paying on each one of these debts? It's $50 here, $150 there, $300 there. All these little things add up. And now that those debts are wiped away, all that money is back in your checkbook. So that can go into your emergency fund. Or like Scott said, if there's $120,000 in equity there, all of your debts are wiped out and you're putting some more money into your emergency fund. What does a fully funded emergency fund look like? Is it three months of expenses, six months, 12 months? You know, could you fund your entire gap year if it's 12 months with the sale of this property after you've paid off all these debts and then still continue with whatever payments you were making to these other debts, still put that into your emergency fund for your current emergency fund? I just think that there's a huge opportunity, but... Like Scott said, let's not make a rash decision. Let's look at all the numbers and see what the condition of the market is, see what the property is actually worth. You know, call up an agent, the agent that sold it to you and say, what could I sell this house for? What are other houses in, is it a condo or is it a house? It's a house. Okay, what are other houses in this neighborhood selling for in the last 30 or 60 days? And that is gonna be a really great example of what you can get for yours. Maybe not exactly. If they're all selling for 220, you could sell yours for 215 because it's got a tenant in place. But that five thousand dollars, you know, less is going to not be any sort of significance in your future. Um, and you're going to be a millionaire real soon once we get all these debts knocked out with the sale of this house. And then you can go back and buy it later. Yeah, your your, your run rate. I bet you. How much do you think these debts are costing you on a monthly basis right now? Oh, I know that number by heart. Um, the minimums all uh, get me by like 130 bucks, but like what we've been paying on it is like 550 a month. Great. And then when your student loans get out of forbearance, how much are those going to be a month? 325. Great. So you're gonna you're gonna have to be spending at least 400, 500 a month to make the minimums on all of these debts come September, right? And 
right? And, and, and you will want to pay $800 a month. And your core problem coming into this call was you're, you feel like you're making good income. You have two jobs and all that kind of stuff, but you still feel broke. It's because of this, right? If you, if you can knock those out again, you can either do that by grinding out with your financial position, which, well, you should, you should do that by grinding out with your financial position and continuing to, to have the cash flow come in on those places, in those places, keep a tight budget and all that kind of stuff. But you can, can, can knock them all out with the sale of this property, I think. Um, okay. So we've kind of covered, we kind of covered that one. I think, um, what, what else can we help you with today? What, what are some other things you want to ask about, or do you want to keep going on that? Or what, what's the next best thing we could talk about for you? So I am putting a lot away, uh, for retirement. I did pull away for retirement. Um, going forward, I'm trying to get that back and really build up that financial. Remember we were talking about putting that more into cash. But I keep seeing like these huge expenses pop up, right? Like my partner's general surgery is going to be seven grand. I know we're replacing our car soon. Uh, we've been without a car payment for the last three years, and it's been wonderful. It's just, uh, I guess, like keeping that motivation going because, like, it's every time I reach a milestone, it's like, uh oh, here's something else. Uh oh, here's something else. Mm. Well, I, I think I think you're probably not budgeting for those. Right. So in your budget, you need to have like a, a miscellaneous reserve fund that's like 500 a month um, or something like that that says, hey, like every 10 years, 15 years, you know, depending on you're going to need a new car. Right. With the, with that every uh, there's going to be a, a health situation every five, seven years. But, you know, and that could be molars. It can be you break your leg while hiking or, you know. Uh, I don't know what's a gardening injury you can get, uh, but that those are the kinds of things you got to prepare for inside of your budget, I think. And so I imagine that I, how are you, are you comfortable with the concept of CapEx with your rental properties? No. Okay. So maybe, maybe this is a good framework for you. The, the roof, how much does it cost to replace a roof? Like 15, 20 grand, right? Yep. So let's call it 20 grand. And how often do you have to replace a roof? Once every 20 years. Once every 20 years. So that's, that means that it, uh, once every 20 years, you spend 20 grand. That means you spend 1,000 on average every year for your roof. That means you spend on average 80 bucks every month for your roof, right? And that was one of the things I pointed out to you in your cash flow that's not being in, in ca calculated inside your rental property. You got the, the same thing that happens in life, right? The new car, the, all that kind of stuff. And that has to be budgeted for, and you need to kind of make a, a monthly guess as to what that number is. For a rental property, I always assume it's about 250 bucks because I got $80 for the roof. I got, you know, the kitchen needs to be updated every 30 years uh, in, in, in some capacity, the electrical system or the, 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 the whatever, right? Like all those things together will be 200, 250 bucks for CapEx for the rental property. And that same kind of stuff will come up in life, right? My car insurance, I pay once every six months in uh, a six month installment, you know, and so on and so forth. So I would, I think that's that, what do you think? Does that resonate? Do you think that that's not being included in your cash flow right now? Oh, in your, in your budgeting? it is not, it's not. And uh, it puts it into like a different perspective too. Yeah, your yeah. hundred dollars a month positive cash flow. If you take Scott's two hundred and fifty dollars, you're actually losing a hundred and fifty dollars a month by holding on to the rental property. I did some very rough, very quick math. You had submitted um, a list of debts that you had when you applied to be on the show. I added that up, and I got forty two thousand seven hundred and fifteen dollars. If you sold this and profited a hundred and twenty thousand. You would have, after paying off all your debts, you would have $77,285. So your gap year is ready as soon as you close on this house. You funded it. You, because you make 50000 a year right now. So you, and you have six months left when you come back from your gap year. I mean, you're going to have expenses, so probably not. But you have funded, oh wait, no, yeah. Sorry, I'm not thinking straight. You have funded your gap year. You have $50,000 to just go off and do whatever. Plus, you can come back and take six months to find a job before you need to really start looking. Probably more because that's income, not expenses. So sell that house is my suggestion. And of course, your mileage may vary. You should definitely talk to an agent. But that seems to be the easy win here that gets you 
that doesn't even get you back to zero. That pushes you way over to a positive net worth and additionally positive net worth. And all of this, all of your dreams can come true. Well, well. Or you can just continue <laughs> to own this house. Yeah. Well, well, and I will say, I would say you, you, get, you get all that cash, but remember like you're the danger. I think another danger that you're in with this is just, you could pay off all those debts, but if you, if you don't change your budgeting and your cash flow management strategy to account for what we just discussed, then you're going to constantly find yourself losing yet again, for reasons that you don't understand with that, without making a very conservative CapEx allocation. So if you think you're saving a thousand dollars a month right now, you're probably only saving 500 because of the the stuff that's coming up with with the bowlers and all this other kind of stuff right and so that you know just make sure you're using that same framework when you're estimating how much you need for the gap year and for all those other types of things as well if you if you decide to sell a property and keep those proceeds um but i think that's i think that's a that that and the concept of capital allocation and this bogey in your budget the capex thing um is a uh, are are the two root causes here. I think of why you're doing well, but you don't feel like you're doing well because it's not showing up in your bank account and your freedom quotient or your financial runway. That makes perfect sense. And so like, was it by saving so much um, the last three years for my retirement accounts kind of not giving me a clearer picture of how much it really costs to live? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying more I think I, those that money in your retirement accounts isn't really helping you like feel free right now, and I think that over the last three years you've probably deferred cap capital and like things that like these or haven't been accumulating for or haven't been budgeting around the fact that you're going to have these kind of like one off large events that require seven thousand dollars in cash, and so that that because that's a monthly expense that shows up once every three years in a huge expense and you know and it all comes at once right it's it's never like you have just one seven thousand dollar expense every five years you have all three hitting and and at the same time for 20 grand um and then that just completely erodes everything that's why you got a budget for that pay off your debts keep an emergency reserve so that you know hey you've got a a six months emergency reserve that's that's what five thirty grand Great, and you just dip into that, and then you rebuild it, and then you're good to go. Um, wh whenever these these items do come up, um, no one likes spending all of that money um, <laughs> on, on on these types of things. But but to plan for it, I think is the key. So I would say that your 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 biggest issue is that you haven't been putting into your budget a solid cons cons like, hey, that's my five hundred dollars that just is for the unpredicted thing that will come up, and then the next one is that instead of um, paying off the low, the, the, the high interest debt and building your emergency reserve. I would say, I, in my opinion, you've been putting too much into the 457 plan, um, which is not giving you freedom right now. And is, is not helping you feel better about the situation or advance you towards some of your goals. All for the 457 plan. Once we're in a better position with the debts and we got a solid emergency reserve. Okay. I'm excited for what is going to happen for you in the next couple of months, because I see your eyes lighting up and like, ooh, ooh. And I think this is going to be a super awesome time. Uh, I would uh, I would caution against just like jumping in with both feet. Definitely think through and what can I do with this rental property? Is it, you know, can I uh, still qualify for this section 121 exclusion? Cause then that $77,000 and that's not a quote, I don't know the market, but that $77,000 is yours and you pay zero to uncle Sam, which is the best amount to pay to uncle Sam. In my opinion, I do much better with my money than he does. I mean, you're saying she'll clear 120 grand and 40 of 40 some odd will go to the debts at the Ooh. 77 is what's left over. Is that right? Yes. Yes. The 120. Okay. And that's, you know, that's ballpark numbers. You still have closing costs. So uh, real estate fees and, you know, title insurance and all that random stuff. Uh, but right now is a really great time to be a seller. So maybe somebody will write you an offer and offer to pay some of those expenses for you. So um, definitely start doing research and look into the numbers, you know, get a quote from your agent. What do you think this will sell for? And this is my, exp you know, I have a hundred thousand dollars left over. So that's or on the mortgage. So once that's paid off, there's just, I see a huge opportunity here 
for you. And then, you know, when you're trying to decide which offer to take, go for the one that has the most chance of closing. So the person who's putting the most money down or has the best credit score or their lender sends a letter that says they're so approved, blah, blah, blah. Um, rather than the the person who's putting 3.5% down and they're barely qualified for the loan. But yeah, you can always come back and buy this house again later once you're a millionaire. Or, or yeah, or once you're accumulating thirty to fifty thousand dollars a year, twenty thousand a year in cash that you can place towards it, and you buy a, prop, a property like this every other year, according to your system, or all that kind of stuff. You don't have to be a millionaire to buy this property. Um, no, when she's a millionaire, she can go back and buy it, so she continues to own it because it was her first house. Oh, for all the happy memories, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's exciting. I have goosebumps, and I'm definitely going to do their research and contact my CPA and. My old agent still works, and so um, I reached out to him, too, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, just all that felt so far away, and now, like, it's possible, and that's, woo! <laughs> that's the whole well, point good. of the show! Because <laughs> when you're in the middle of the slog, it's hard to see, you're like, oh, this is the way I'm going to go. Well, not necessarily. There's other ways that you can go, but it's hard to see different options. So that's what we're here for. I'm so excited. You have to send me another note in like three or six months after you've made the decision on what you're going to do and have, you know, progressed a little bit more. I want to follow up with you and see what's going on because this, oh, I have so much excitement for you. <laughs> I appreciate y'all so much. Thank you. Oh, Tiara, yeah, I'm you. so glad you reached out. This was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. This is going to be a fabulous, fabulous episode. Yay. <laughs> thank you, guys. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, that was Angela Rosman with Tread Lightly, Retire Early. Scott, what did you think? Uh, I, I, I thought it was helpful. I learned I learned a lot of good information about this. I uh, I. I I kind of had need to listen when um, the topic of, of, of women and money or, or stuff, stuff that I can't understand as a, as a man um, necessarily as well um, comes up. And I think that, that that's really interesting. And I think it's great that there's a, there's places and that we're, we're making women who are prominent in the financial space, more prominent and giving them more of a, of a, of a place to for people to find them and to discuss those issues that um, are more appropriate there. So I think it's great and go, definitely go check out, that Facebook group. I also think on that note with the Facebook groups that um, Facebook is an amplifier of whatever, you, and they've been criticized for this, right? That they, they, they around the, the way that they're, you know, politicizing certain folks or whatever, because the extreme content gets all the more interaction and that kind of stuff. Well, it's an amplifier for me on Facebook because I, my, I'm just in all these Facebook groups. I'm in, of course, Bigger Pockets, Bigger Real Estate Rookie, Bigger Pockets Money, but I'm also in some other ones like Mustachians in Practice for Mr. Buddy Mustache fans, and one called Choose Fi. And I would just encourage you to go out there and, like, if you're on Facebook, you find yourself getting sucked in down that rabbit hole. How do you create a world in which you're getting sucked into the healthy rabbit hole of? personal finance and investing in these types of things in these kinds of groups rather than in stuff that might be unproductive or distracting or make you mad or angry or those types of things um, might be a better, a good, a good way to go about it. And so go join our Facebook group and um, go join Angela's Facebook group and, and, and maybe a few others. Yeah. You really want to immerse yourself in the financial space when you're, especially when you're just getting started, like Angela did, she read all the blogs and did all the things it's so important to get different perspectives because you are going to learn from everybody, but there might be somebody that really, really speaks the same language that you do. And the Facebook groups are a great place to start. You can't, people will recommend other bloggers, other podcasts all the time. And it's fantastic. We just want you to learn the information and however you can find that information is the best way to learn it. Absolutely. Okay, Scott, should we get out of here? Let's do it. From episode 191 of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast, he is Scott Trench, and I am Mindy Jensen saying, after two, kangaroo. <laughs>